Yay! Okay, so if anyone's been here for a long time, you've heard Bulletproof by Pop Lee Self about four times. Uh, in that song it says, is everybody happy now? Is everybody happy? Yeah. Is everyone really happy? Yeah. Right, so you must have had loads of technical talks. This isn't a technical talk. This is pretty much a fun talk. Uh, this is a history of old ways of doing code that I did when I should have I didn't know better, but I should have, and I do now. Uh, that song's from the year 2000. So there may be someone who wasn't born when that was released. Um, however, it pretty much hits the middle of all the demos I'm going to give you. So this is, just to check you're in the right room, my worst code was my best code. Someone corrected me on Twitter and said, you should have had a better title. It should have been the best of code, the worst of code. Charles Dickens, so I missed a trick on getting a very literary title onto my presentation. So this is an example of code. Now, this of old code, now, you may have done retrospectives. Has anyone seen this before? At the start of a retrospective, how we put this up? And we say, whatever we find out, whatever we learn, we were pretty much doing the best job we could, given what we had, given the technology we had and the situation at hand. You normally use that in retrospectives. Please apply this to the code or the projects that I'm about to discuss. They were my worst code, but at times they were my best code. We're gonna go back in time. This is where I scarily go, how many people were not born before 1993? Yep. Yep, right. This is code I wrote before you were born. So, okay, that's a scary thought. All right. So all the calendars, it's not a day of the week of the month, it's a year. Like, you know, um, I improvised. So one of the first things early I worked on, you may have seen Sky News, heard of B Sky B. Um, we wrote their first in-house weather system. I did it as part of an independent company called Lighthouse Computer Graphics. Um, it was a long time ago. It was Windows 3.1. So if you wanted graphics, normally you'd use Macs. Things like Mac Quadras were out then and things like that. But we were using Windows PCs. So that was the kind of tool that the weatherman would have. The weatherman, when I delivered the first system to train him on it, I handed him the mouse and he said, what's this? <laughs> and I taught him what a mouse was. Right, well, that long ago. Okay, so what that Windows 3.1 PC was gonna do was kind of produce some basic artwork. It was then gonna send it down a serial cable. Because we hadn't got a network, we talked down serial cables to another PC. This PC had a graphics card in it. Graphics card, I looked up what the price of a gra uh, what um, inflation has done to the price of that graphics card. It was 5,000 pounds in 93. It now costs you 10,000 pounds. That is to do broadcast video graphics. Still, as in one image broadcast video graphics, not animations, not playing back video, just the ability to show one image. That was inside there, and what happened was there's a little DOS program that took the RS-232 set of commands and could send them to an onboard processor that churned through those commands and actually rendered it onto the hardware. It had a massive, massive 1.4 meg of memory, which is one picture in TV terms of PAL. And that would go out to the TV guys, and you'd have a weather map. And you go, so how did this graphics card take it? Did we create bitmaps? Did we do, no, no. We created a postscript file. We sent a postscript file down a serial cable, and it took this postscript file that's designed for printers, remember that's what postscript was really about, printers, and rendered it as raster graphics. We used CorelDRAW 4.0. 
Woo! Indeed. Um, this was the Windows equivalent of Adobe Illustrator in the same way that my cat is the feline equivalent of, I don't know, Mo Farah winning a gold medal. It's not the best thing in the world. The one thing it could do is produce an encapsulated postscript file. So, how do you get a weatherman, who doesn't know what a mouse is, remember that, to generate graphics on here that we can then export to be a weather map? And believe me, it looked like that with little dots because it didn't have 24 million colors. It only had 64,000 with a limited palette. I think that's what we were working with. So, we need some kind of interface for Corel Draw. Corel Draw is not extensible. There is no COM components, there is no scripting engine. So, clearly, what you need to do is get the latest GUI tool in Windows, that is Visual Basic 1.0. Right? You know it's Visual Basic 1.0 because they still thought they were equivalent to C in that they had a Mac file, a make file what became a VBP in the long run. So we created one of these Windows Forms apps with buttons on. The Windows Forms app could sit on top of CorelDRAW, hiding the bottom of the window. On there, we could put insert weather symbol, put an arrow on, all sorts of things like that. And in order to get CorelDRAW to do that, we would send keystrokes to it. Anyone who's done Visual Basic, there was a command called send keys, and you could send keys to another window. We would send Alt F for the file menu, I for import, and then import the right symbol if they chose weather symbol temperature 24. And it would locate the right symbol on the disk and put it into Corel. Not only that, we did areas of hot, sun, rain. You know the kind of thing where you see a blue area on a map showing where the rain is. And we had, we had rain, we had shadow, we had sun, we had blue for ice. They were all in the top left corner of CorelDRAW, little tiny boxes, like one by one pixels that you put in emails now to track people. So that when we needed to export the sun, we ran a macro that clicked a mouse. By the way, Windows could record mouse movements and keystrokes into something called macros. So you ran this macro, it would click on the little dot that was for sun. The weatherman would have said, this area is sun. It would group it with send keys. And then when you export it, you exported just the file to do the sun. At the end of all this, what you have is a map like that. So we took Windows 3.1 CorelDRAW. We sent keys to it. We Ma ran Windows macros, and we managed to get this thing to do broadcast video graphics. At the time, we did it for about £20,000 all in as a system for Sky. The closest competitor was £200,000 to deliver a system. But it was a bit clunky, you know? I mean, we actually found that when we tried to select something in the CorelDRAW palette, for another tool to get a pointer or a joiner or a circle, Windows macros couldn't click on them for some reason. And it was the way the windows were aligned. But we found if you used a utility called Big Desk that did a virtual desktop for your entire windows, Big Desk somehow solved the problem of window handles that allowed us to run macros on it. So it was a pile of software all glued together that was very much Please do not mess with the picture in Corel Draw. If you delete the dots, we don't have sun anymore. <laughs> Things like that. So it wasn't an easy ask. And by the way, rendering that encapsulated postscript, if you put an area of gray on like that, took something like a minute. This was not send it, bang, you've got an image. You used to see that black would fill up, and then it would do a spray paint nozzle for the whole of the outline like this, is a beautiful animation. So we never sent it live to Earth. What they did was do this, capture it, play out the graphics that were captured. And that was my introduction to how to create a weather system out of the most crazy components. We even then later did 
um, cloud and did cloud animations. And we used something called Autodesk Animator. And this was a way of doing AVI files in Windows, in DOS actually, in DOS. We used a language, C-like -sc scripting language, and we managed to get output of actual clouds, satellite images going over, but we were limited to 640 by 480 because that's the output of the card we could get. So, so that was an introduction to how, how to do things. That was VB1 days. Sometime later, we'd got much further on with VB, and I'd stopped working for an independent company, and we now had a little division inside Sky called Broadcast Computing. We were part of the creative services department. There was an IT department. They did desktops, printing, emails, things like that. They did bringing a virus in, letting it, because someone, one of them had admin, it got onto every server in the entire of the estate of Sky, and everyone had to shut down for four days while a group of consultants cleaned out all the viruses. Right, let that be a lesson. If you're an admin, don't map all your drives to every server that you have in the entire network. So we were on a different network. We didn't know what we were doing, really. But we got a commission. They did a morning program. Whoops. It's just fallen off. Look at me. Microphone failing. So they did a morning program to show videos. Um, unbelievably, they called it Morning Glory. If you don't know why that's an odd title, talk to an English person and they can explain it. And what this was, was we were asked to do the clock in the bottom left corner. And you can see this clock, and it's a kind of flower. It started off yellow, by the way, and it's now going to green, and it changes color. So about every four minutes, it rotates through about five, six colors. And that was great. So designer worked on it. Here's the graphics. We got a yellow one. We got a green one. We got a purple one. We got a red one, a green one, blue, all the colors we needed. And we said, oh, you're not going to give us all the ones in between so that we can just load them up. And they said, no, can't you do that? Because can you just take these five, six images and you do it? And we're VB programmers. And VB didn't have an image library. Right? There was no system dot bitmap and things like that from .NET. And it cost thousands to buy a library in to do images. And we were looking at it going, well, this is odd because we're going to have to deal with these as binary files. Binary files are awkward in VB, probably VB4, whatever it was at that time. So it's quite hard to load, and we're not used to it because we don't really write binary files that much. So I tell you what, these images are less than 64K. That's the maximum size of the string. Why don't we load the image as a string? Why don't we then, using a string, manipulate the data and save that string back out and make another image? And that's precisely what we did. Because it seemed to make sense, and it was easy. Now, you have to forgive the resolution on this. Let's see if I can zoom it. It's going to refuse to zoom. Ah. Let's see if I can. One last go. Nope, it's not going to do it. Can you read that just about? So, one of the interesting things in VB, not VB.net, VB, there's a mid-string operator, or mid-operator. You can see the first one here, on this line. Eee, there. That line. And what we say is, get me the caption off this button, and give me, starting at character three, no zeros, it's VB, they start at one, and get me the next four characters. The really weird bit about mid-string is, as well as getting the middle of a string out, you could set the middle of a string. So it was an assignment operator. I could say, middle of this string, set it to this. I'm going to demo you this working on a really simple label. By the way, isn't this how every VB program looked? <laughs> right? If it's a WinForms app, great. So if I do that, you can see it hits that line. The middle of that string is the LLO from Hello World. 
the moment I replace it, bing, it's replaced it and put a dash in it, a high in it. So that's my proof to you that, by the way, you can replace the middle of a string. And this is crucial because you don't want to be fiddling with strings by adding them together because that takes a lot of time. There's reallocation of strings. In the old days, it's really slow. It's 16-bit. It's painful. So what we did was just load a bitmap straight into a string. And you did that, I believe, because I had to write this code yesterday, using a file system object, which is one of those miraculous Chrome objects you can use from VBA or VB. And I can load a string straight in from a file. Notice, we have no encoding. We don't care. This is ASCII. It's 0255. There are no other languages other than English. Right? OK. So we load it into that string. Fine. We can also save it out from a string. So we give it a string. We give it a file name. We can save it out. Really easy code. So what you can see I'm going to do is we're going to load it into a string. And then we're going to go through that string backwards. And I go backwards because the data's at the kind of end of the file. So I'm going to go towards the end of the file, move in a bit, because there's an end of file thing on a bitmap. And I'm going to go back three every time. Is it three every time? Yeah, three every time. Because it's arranged in red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, all the way through the string, 0 to 255, because this is a 24-bit bitmap. Only with bitmaps, there's also an end of row character, which I've ignored in this example because I couldn't be bothered working out yesterday. We never had that in the original because we used this weird format called TGA, which was before kind of, it was a format purely used for broadcast graphics almost by True Vision. And what you get with this is we will, you can see what the image looks like originally. So if I looked at this in hex, it would be 00FF, 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 all the way through the file, virtually to the end. So I go in, 134 characters long. I've edited every third item, set it to FF. And what we've done is change it from blue to cyan. I think that means I've added green and blue together to make cyan. And then I've, left, I've only hit the blue values that were already there. And now I've hit the blue and red next to each other, and we get magenta. So I've gone through that string, poking in values for RGB values, and then saved it back out. So our code that did this, oh, by the way, that's a Windows 2000 VM that's having to run in safe mode because I can't get the driver to work properly in full size. And I didn't want to install with VB6 on a modern machine. Um, because it's polluting in how it installs. I would have had to install the JVM from Microsoft in order to install VB6. That's how bad it would be. So what you get is we load in the yellow. We then load in the green. And we take 2% of what the yellow was, 98% of the green. We have put that out in the new file. Then we do 4% of the yellow. 96% of the green. We worked all our way through producing images like a flipbook for the entire animation. And then we just played them so that every two seconds it loads a new graphic. And there's a new background, which is a new color. It worked perfectly because it's a pre-render. So you don't care about doing it live. You only have to do it once. And it was quick, and you do it in about two days because we've taken a pragmatic view. We handed it over to the engineer. Broadcast engineer looks at this, and they have like an oscilloscope to check how all the colors look, how all the picture looks. You've seen it in old movies where they kind of have you know, whizzy things on old TV people trying to work out uh, what the picture looks like. He spent a day and said, there's a problem with it. It starts off yellow. And then it changes color. So I keep trying to adjust it to keep it yellow. But it doesn't work. And I said, oh, did no one tell you how it's meant to work? And he nearly killed me. So, and that was June 95. So that's how we manipulated bitmaps in strings in VB to avoid having to do something difficult with byte arrays. 
few years later, it's general election time. By the way, we are still eight years before YouTube exists. Because of that reason, and Sky News didn't have a lot of viewers, there is no footage of the 1997 general election on YouTube. There is footage from the BBC, there is footage from ITV, a big commercial channel in the UK, but none from Sky News, which is a shame. Because it would be lovely to show you the Sky News general election a few of the graphics. Unfortunately, I can't. I just cannot get hold of them anyway. So I'm going to have to explain how our system works. Now, why did we have a problem? We'd done local elections before, so regional elections and things like that, and European. And we were VB programmers. We weren't in the IT department. We had an access MDB file. That's where our data was, because we're VB programmers, and we use the access. And access agrees with us on what true and false are, right? because they are not minus one and zero, I assure you, if you're a VB or access programmer. And we stored them on a Novell Network 3.12 file server. This is basically something that just gives you drive letters and prints. That's it. That's pretty much all it's going to do. And during one of our local elections, one of the programs written by one of our developers was locking the access database file regularly to such an extent we couldn't get new results in. When we talked to him afterwards, he said, my software worked perfectly, though. We said, no, it didn't, because it locked this file. And he goes, no, no, my software worked. It's your software didn't. And you're like, right. We had a few discussions like that. And then I thought, that's not going to happen again. We've got to change how we work. SQL Server was version 6.5. It was still from a company called Sybase. Microsoft hadn't rewritten it. If the database got too big, you had to manually expand the files so that your file server didn't run out of disk space. It was sensible. Oracle was a mysterious thing that the IT department owned. We had no idea about it. We didn't even know it existed, probably. So what we thought was, and actually, not we, me, what I thought, I think we should only allow data access via a central location. Right, so there's one place you can get the data. We will cache all the data in memory, every result, every previous result, every name of a candidate, absolutely everything. We'll all be in dictionaries, whatever, arrays, probably arrays, probably not dictionaries at that point. And we will save data to the access MDB file for, from this central location, but we will have a lock on it so no one else can get to it. That will stop anyone else locking it. And we will do, call it a DB app. Somehow you'll connect to this DB app with connections, custom, and you'll use Olay Remote Automation, which was a forerunner of DCOM, and they'll connect to a WinForm application, which will hand out connections and give them all the data from this miraculous cache in memory. So what we actually did, me, not we, was we wrote our own database server just for general elections. That's what I did. I wrote, effectively, a very customized database server. And how it actually worked was we had this Novell server hosting an access MDB file. It's just a file system with a like E drive or F drive. It talked to the DB server, which is running Windows NT4. When you run Windows NT4 workstation, Microsoft found, actually, with Windows NT351, people were using it as a server, naughty, naughty. So they limit you to 10 connections on a workstation, whereas you can have many more connections on a server. So we had a limit of 10 connections. We had a results processor coming in from the news system. Unbelievably, what they did was every time they got a new, what they're called, wires, so a result saying, hey, there's a result for London East. Labour have got this many votes. Conservative have got this many votes. It comes into their newsroom system, and their newsroom system prints it to a serial printer, only it's not a serial printer, it's us. At the end of a very, very long cable, RS-422 could go up to 500 meters, not a tiny distance, and we would absorb effectively what was designed to print out on an old-fashioned printer. And that's how we got automated results. We had two boxes for manual results running NT4, result viewers for the producers, people in the studio, so they could look up any result at the desk and find out what was happening. We had an election analyst with Excel 97 who could connect to our DB app. 
DB server. And then we had 2D graphics that said, hey, Labour's just won London East. And a little counter going, how many seats each party has won? And we had things like histograms. So Labour vote, 25. Conservative, 20. The difference from last time. Maps of the country with all the little colours all over it. You've seen them. It's an election. And then we even hooked into a silicon graphics workstation to do 3D images of the Houses of Parliament. Really kind of doom-style images of the Houses of Parliament almost, where you had little men that were coloured, kind of little men appearing as it went along to show, if this goes like this, there'll be this many blue people on this side, this many red people, and showing whether someone had a majority. And that's how we run the general election. Not only that, every VB programme that we ran was running pause and continue, so that we could, we did not run Xe's, we ran the full Visual Basic, Visual Studio, so that if we had any logic errors in our code, we could pause it, edit the code live, and then press play to carry on running it. You may think that's a bit weird, but you only get to run this software once. That night, never again. So it better work, and the easiest way of making it work is pause and continue and live edit. The other interesting thing that happened that night, and you may go, why isn't everything going through the same router? We didn't know they weren't going through the same router. We found that out when the router at the top that talked to our network server blew up. That's owned by the IT department. We stopped being able to write to our MDB file, but unbelievably, our magical DB server had cached everything in memory and could deliver all the results to all the other pieces. So unbelievably, it saved our backside, running it like that. I would never write that again. And think about this. Some of those boxes are 32-bit. Some of them are 16-bit. Excel is definitely 16-bit. So Windows 95 had to be 16-bit because of the, the uh, graphics card we were using. So how did we do it? That's a summary. The Visual Basic team were the guys who brought you DCOM. I don't know if you knew that, but they wrote something called Ole Remote Automation. They designed it all, it became DCOM. That maybe is why it's a bit dodgy, right? We had to use Visual Basic 4 because we needed 16-bit on Windows 95, but we needed 32-bit on Windows NT4. Excel worked. We even connected it because we had it on trial. A DEC Alpha NT workstation could also absorb results from our DB server. Which may, you may all go, well, yes. The different processor on a DEC Alpha to an Intel means it had to translate every number and reverse it bitwise because of something called Little Endian and Big Endian. So it's quite impressive it managed to do that. And the whole point was this software only had to work once. That meant pause and continue. And that meant we even banned line continuation characters because they broke pause and continue in VB4, and you would have to restart the app. By the way, at any time you edited your code, you could not save it. So everyone was instructed that if you edit the code, you select all, copy it into Notepad, and save it down with the right file name. So if you have to restart the app, you can patch it all back in. And by the way, everyone who worked on this would start work at 10 o'clock on Thursday morning, and we would finish at 6 o'clock on Friday evening. So that was our shift pattern for doing that election. It's a miracle anything got out. So, so that was the election, which I can't show you the graphics for. So annoying. By May 2005, I was um, a consultant. Or, no, I was running my, yes, I was a consultant. So I'd stopped running my, I'd left Sky, I'd gone to an interactive TV startup, I'd then started my own company, and then uh, with a couple of friends, and then we broke that up, and I just went freelancing. I got sick of writing boilerplate code for doing access to databases. I was always writing something that loaded it, something that deleted it, something that inserted it, something that got a list of it. It's really boring. I think what you'd like to do is template all that. 
Or, by the way, if you haven't written ORM, try and write a compiler. But only do it once, please, just once. Now, here's the history of ORMs, the, a brief kind of rundown. Hibernate, the Java library to do ORMs, object relational mapping, which came out about 2001. And then, people in the .NET world went, oh, that needs an N in front of it. Uh, because the X unit guys have already got something called N unit, so we should do N hibernate. So that was coming out in 2004. Liam Wesley was ignorant of all of this. So I had no idea people were doing ORMs. I just knew I had a problem. Um, and I decided I was going to create something originally called EasyDB, then it became RapidDB. And the idea was I specify a kind of generic database format. I go, I'm going to kind of start with the database, and I'm going to auto-generate code. And that specification would generate all your classes for insert, delete, update list, audit tables, do primary keys, do foreign keys, create the code modules, create the database scripts, make it in SQL 2000, SQL 2005, Access MDB, IBM DB2, MySQL, Oracle. So you can see I had, you know, tiny ambition, right? Uh, oh, and it could also create it for SQL Compact Framework for Windows Mobile, the old Windows Mobile that worked on a Palm device, and create VB and C code to run on a mobile device as well, right? I can tell you now, there was no code generators. So we didn't have code generators, no, nothing to help me write what the code should be, build it. We also had no partial classes either, and no link. So that's where we were. And I spent ages writing this as just a pet project, because when you're a consultant contractor, you've got free time. So you're writing this kind of stuff, going, this is really interesting. I quite like what we're doing, you know, how to do it. Eventually, QVC, the shopping channel, came along and said, can you write us this system for moderating SMS messages? I know you've written one before for Sky. I had to rewrite it, and I rewrote it in two weeks. And I could only do that because I could use my RapidDB library to say, that's what a database should look like. Create me all the code modules. Then I've got everything to write to the database. It is exactly what you would use now. I talked about it at the first ever community event Developer, 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 which has become DDD Melbourne, DDD Perth, all the DDDs that were in the UK in 2005. By 2006, Link, Link to SQL had come out. I put RapidDB on SourceForge going, hey, it's open source, I don't care. Maybe people would like it and support it. Not one update by me or anyone else. So no one did. Uh, and that's probably because things like Link to SQL would smash it out of the park, and then Entity Framework killed off Link to SQL, made everyone grumpy about RMs in .NET for a very long time because it wasn't the best thing in the world, and eventually EF Core came along and did what Link to SQL did, and everyone was happy again. That's my brief history of RMs. So what does this look like? So this is the code taken exactly as is from... Um, SourceForge. It's yet another VB app. It's gray. It's got gray buttons. There's no styling. I'm going to have to put glasses on because it's a tiny font. And you know that VB could never handle anything like um, uh, zooming in or high res or any DPI changes. So it's awful. That's why they invented it, WPF. So this is how you created your database. You created a schema. You did lots of XML. XML was the thing. It was a thing then, not JSON. XML was a thing. I'd, and you could do all this. And because I was being so determined to be generic, you didn't get to say, I want a 32-bit integer. You just got the chance to say, I think it's going to be a type ID. I think it's going to be a type short text. I think it's going to be a type number. And that's it. That's what you got. And that made sure it would work across every single database going in a generic way. So you define this DB. You said whether it needed keys, whether it had primary keys, everything like that. 
So this little demo, which is straight off SourceForge, unbelievable that it actually works. I can load in a sample DB. It says, yes, I've loaded it OK. You can then create the core modules, code modules, and it's created them. So let's go and have a look at those. There's someone down here. Mm. C temp rapid DB. And we have code modules. We have a C sharp code module. We can look at that in Notepad++ because it's a bit easier. And you can see how this is completely created. Oh, yes, by the way, I quite like regions. Um, so there's lots of region comments in here. But you end up with code that can do things like search for a list of companies. And that was your generic search. And then you can see that further down, it started to do safe field names and things like that. I don't think I knew about SQL parameters. So, so I think I went and did safe field names to try and protect myself against SQL injection here and stuff like that. So all of this would boilerplate your entire code base in C Sharp or C Sharp for Compact Framework and for both 1.1 and 2.0 because they were different. And equally, it could go off and create your database for you. So if I create a new database, NDC Oslo new, ah. there we are. And I tell it to create it in NDC Oslo new. You can see it's created all the tables. It's even got things like foreign keys. There. So you've got foreign keys going between the order info, product info table. So you can see how many items from products have been ordered, all that kind of thing, all the nice relational database stuff. And it even handled things like auditing. So audit tables. The reason you shouldn't write that is it's way too ambitious. So it didn't really do transactions as well as it should have done. It never could adopt a link to SQL because we had no partial classes. Once you generated the code modules and then you started hacking them, you were bust because you couldn't regenerate them. Because right? your changes were now thrown away. So if we'd have had partial classes, woo, my head would have gone bam, because I could just add stuff. And then I could do my custom stuff. And it would have worked really nicely, but I'd have failed to do the link to SQL. So I let, ages later, Mark Rendell went and sorted out simple data, doing a much nicer way of doing things. And even he gave up on it. Because, you know, the effort's not worth it. But the interesting thing about that is it allowed me to generate a demo for QVC UK in under two weeks. That got me the contract for the next seven years at £600 a month to run the system at QVC that bankrolled my entire contract company for the next six, seven years. So it also taught me a hell of a lot about databases. It taught me that if you were in IBM DB2, your database name cannot be longer than eight letters. Right? Because then it can be, exist on any file system that DB2 may run on, including mainframes where you are limited to file lengths of eight letters. Um, it taught me that Oracle needed to prefetch IDs. It doesn't have auto-incrementing primary keys, so you have to prefetch the ID. The code handled that. Oracle. If you save a null uh, empty string to a string column, it coerces it to null in the default options. So you have to handle string manipulation properly. So it taught me huge amounts about a database. And it got me a contract that kept my company going for six years. It didn't get support, and I didn't really continue using it. By March 2009, I was still an independent. And I delivered a ticketing system to a company called Hattrick Productions. They do programs, Have I Got News For You, The Kumars at Number 42, a load of comedy programs on, on TV in the UK. And they wanted something to handle 
giving tickets for free to their t television recordings, managing the system and things like that. We'd written one previously with another company, but they wanted a rewrite of it so they could do electronic ticketing. If they could do electronic ticketing, where it just sent them emails, that would save them £10,000 a year in mail-out costs and printing costs of sending tickets out. Therefore, I had £10,000 given to me to write a ticketing system, and it would save money within one year. So that's good. This was a classic ASP application. So it was interesting to note that when I got my code base for the ticketing system out, that I tried to load it in Visual Studio 2019, it converted it really well, and then told me, you can't possibly talk to that website, because uh, I forgot, you've got to run Visual Studio in administration mode to talk to IS, which is going to run it. So, and then you get to weird stuff like, so what is the administrator login? Because I can't remember what it would be. So here's something. You could either say this is my best code or my worst code. Depends how you feel about this. I immediately went into the user info table. That's where my logins were. And I looked at it and said, there's a hash and a salt. I've done this properly. I didn't put a bloody plain text password in. So I can't get to that. OK, so how do I deal with that? Tell you what, why don't I just delete everything from that table? So I'm just going to delete that. Hey. There are now no users in this system to log in with, which is great, because what it says is, give me an initial login name that I'll make administrator. <laughs> right. And you know what I thought at that point? You're a genius. <laughs> and I can't retype a password live. Uh, let's do that. And I've created my first login. And the nice thing is, even though obviously it's the first login, I can still access everything that was in the system. Right, that call it security. By the way, I also couldn't remember the Windows 2000 VM admin password. Very similarly in Windows 2000, if you go in and delete one file called SAM that's somewhere in Windows System 32, etc., something, 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 you can Google it. If you delete SAM, the one file, that's the entire password database for Windows 2000. And when you start it, administrator starts with no password. Right. Uh, someone named uh, Microsoft thought about security and then decided not to do it. So. This is the main screen for the ticking application. This is classic ASP. Oh, I think it's, uh, no, it's ASP web forms. Um, you would be able to tell it's ASP web forms because there will be something called view state in it that's massive. This hidden field, right? And when I first did this, I thought, right, this is a list of all the tickets people have requested. And we are going to have tickets that are pending, and we're gradually going to reject or accept them. That's pretty much it. And we might adjust how many tickets they get as well, because they asked for four, but there's so many people asked for them, we're only going to give people two and things like that. And I tested it out, and we had you know 10 requests in. And I did this post back, then it came back, rebuilt the three tables. You did reject, went in, did the work on rejecting a ticket, came back, rendered the tables. It was fine. We then had tested it with how many ticket requests you would get, 500. Every time you hit a button, it took 20 seconds. Because it had to go back, tell it, by the way, this one, one thing here is going to get rejected. I would save that in the database and then come all the way back and re-render the screen. If there's 400 requests and it takes 20 seconds to do a page back, post back, that is... 130 minutes, that's two hours to a job that should take about 10 minutes, right? Not gonna work. The really interesting bit is someone's gonna go, Ajax, no, no, no. The new thing was jQuery, 
right? I had jQuery at my side. So what could I do with jQuery to make this work? Well, let's go and have a look at the code. And this I can make bigger, which is really good. Do, 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 do. There we are. So, by the way, for anyone who's going, oh, wow, that's a VB programmer writing JavaScript. He's put M's in front of things to make sure that I understand it's a module level variable, um, which is genuinely what I just did. So, we have things. So, what I'm looking for is a rejected, reject ticket. So what the reject ticket button actually does is it says, move this table row, this table row name ID, so there's an ID for each table row, and move it to this other table, and then update a ticket request thing. If we go and look at what move table row does, it's a bit of jQuery that goes and does a bit of funky stuff, so that when you hit the re reject button, or pending button, so I'll hit pending. Look at that. Woo! So this is just moving things between the tables. So, bee, bee, super fast. It has yet to save anything. <laughs> this is crucial. You have not saved what you've done so far. The more amazing thing is a browser, when told that this row belongs over here, just renders it instantly. Right, just does what it's told. Is this row was over here, but it's now over here. That's fine. Who cares? If you view the page source, you would end up finding a hidden field. Not view state, not one of the normal ones, but ticket request updates. Now, the tricky bit is what I actually need is to look at it live because I want to see what value's in there. So it's in the body. Where's find? Find, find, find. Ah, there you are. So, what value? And I've gone past it, that's naughty. Ticket request updates. It's got values, look, can you see them? The T means it's a ticket. The number is the ID, and the equal is what's happened to it. Zero means it's been moved to pending. Minus one means rejected. Plus one means accepted. In fact, I think the numbers refer to the number of tickets you've requested as well. So what you do in this screen is you can fiddle endlessly going reject, pending, reject, pending to the same person. They keep getting added to this hidden field. And when you finally hit save and it does the massive web forms post back, we take the hidden field and we process it, ignoring any duplicates. We have created an event stream architecture in a web form that takes an event stream, stream of whatever the customer did and only takes the most recent update as valid. So this is amazing. You know, uh, to be honest, this is completely insane and how I got away with it, I don't know. How I even came up with this, I can only believe that I was powered by some form of alcohol at the time. But it worked, and it was jQuery. I could put jQuery on my CV um, in a way that you should never put jQuery on your CV. And then from our last example, it was September 10, 2010. Um, I was doing MC3 file, file processing at a startup. So this is Warner Music, EMI, and Sony giving us their entire music collections. What the entire music collection of EMI means is you get delivered on a pallet by a forklift truck 
a set of hard drives too heavy for a human being to carry that you then have to plug into your server, copy all the files onto your servers, onto your SAN, and then start processing them. They are all uncompressed files. Each of these is like 400 meg. It's, that's right, because 650 meg was a CD. It was a bit more compressed. It was lossless compression in order to get under the 650, but it was big. There's lots of 20, 30, 40 hard drives that you plugged in. The initial developers were trying to process it using BizTalk. Like, this is insane. They were moving 600 megs at a time through BizTalk server, and it seemed to take quite a while. They then were talking about how can we mark it as processed, how do we do this? And I went, I think what we might do is we'll use our SAN storage, 100 terabytes of SAN storage in the cupboard um, connected, just mapped as drive letters to machines. And what we'll do is we'll load an album, say album 187676, and we'll put it in a receive folder. And there'll be little jobs waiting for folders to get filled. It'll wait till that folder seems to be not busy for at least five minutes, that there's nothing added to it. Once there's nothing added to it again, it'll look at it, look at the XML, the metadata, check all the files have arrived. If they haven't, moves the folder. Not copies, moves the entire folder to an error folder. If it succeeds, oh yeah, and it fills in the details of why it had an error. If the artwork fails, so artwork processing, we made thumbnails, we made big ones, we made ones for website, ones for the front page of the website, one for the middle, all that kind of artwork thing. We did that as well. Unbelievably, Warner used to send us images that would fail in the .NET framework, but would work, wouldn't load in paint.net either, because paint.net is built on the .NET framework, but would load in MS Paint, which you could then resave and then use as your master. You would find that in the details. And you also then did a transcoding job. That was the longest thing that happened. And because it's just a file on a file system, we could farm it out to loads of little workers that could do individual files. So they'd all go in and go, right, have we got, have we got any files? Do this, right, I'll grab that file, I'll start transcoding it. The way you transcoded the entire catalog of EMI and Warner in our office was everyone, when they left for work in the evening, set a little executable going. Let's just even... So a little executable going on their machine, which would go off and start processing messages. And then in the morning, they'd close it down because they'd want to do their actual job, right? <laughs> it's one of those things. So that was our rendering farm. Everyone's desktop PCs in the evenings. Don't turn them off, please. Any problems with transcoding, it would put them over in the error. And it would just move these folders. So this folder got moved from received to artwork, to transcoding, to complete. If it had any errors, it got moved to errors. We found out that if you use UNC paths, you know how you go slash slash my server slash folder share slash slash. And if you move that to exactly the same kind of UNC, it did a copy, then a delete. But if you map the drive letter, it went like that. It's instant because it writes to the file system and goes, I can just edit a directory entry and move where it exists on the whole system. So I did all this, and we, when, when you have a problem with it, you look in the text file, you find out what's wrong, you go and edit it, and then you, how do you resubmit? Well, you examine the error details, hand edit stuff, rename files that might have failed. By the way, a question mark that exists in OSX, do you know you can have a question mark in a file name on a Mac? Do you know that that question mark isn't the ASCII question mark character? It's an extended code question mark. So it will not be found if you match a title in your metadata to the file on the file system because it will have renamed it. So we had to deal with all that. So we fixed things. And all we did was rename errordetails.txt. So we had an audit of what happened, move the file back, and then the process would start again. It would just go back. So we had the ability to replay any encoding. And someone said, how come we've spent two years trying to work out how to get this through BizTalk and how to do fancy kind of encoding system, and this is how it works? And my answer was, you don't get to put, I wrote something that moved files onto your CDB. Right? It's not a sellable skill. And that's the last example I've got, because by now, 
I then moved to Huddle. I had people like Ian Cooper and Toby Henderson work, I was working with, and they wouldn't allow me to do shit like this. Right? Let's be honest. Uh, we grew up. We had better tooling. We did better things. But in all those, that history of stuff, it allowed us to get work done, get stuff out. You will, at some point in your career, even now, be asked to do stuff like this. It is not a problem as long as you understand what you're doing and it solves the problem for the customer and then possibly you either leave the company or you fix it and do it properly. So that's why I believe some of my worst code was my best code and I hope you enjoyed a more fun talk so you didn't have to think for about now. Thank you very much. Any questions? I, you might have some very weird ones, but I'm happy to answer any. No. Phew. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and I'll be on the cruise, and I'll be at the party. You will notice me at the party. That's all I can say. So see you tomorrow or tonight. Thank you very much.